Good day to you. God bless you. Say, welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study. I are ready to get back in our Father's Word. Chapter 7, the great book of Isaiah. Yahweh's salvation. That's something you always want to count on. You know, let's get right into this uh, seventh chapter. What you're going to have is kind of a civil war going on between the house of Judah and the house of Israel. But they're going to have a foreigner in the midst. It will, it will be Syria. In other words, you're going to have three kings. And God's going to have his little say about this. Israel will take on a foreign king to try to defeat the king of Judah. And God's going to give him a sign. He's going to tell him about a king that will be the king. So having said that, um, let's, get, let's get acquainted with the kings. Chapter 7, verse 1, the great book of Isaiah, verse 1, and it reads... And it came to pass in the days of Ahaz, that's the possessor, the son of Jothan, them, the son of, of uh, Uzziah, the, um, the strength of Yah, what a name, king of Judah, that reason the king of Syria. Now pay attention, there's two different kings, one of uh, Judah, one of Syria, and Pekah, the son of Remaliah, king of Israel, three kings went up toward Jerusalem to war against it, but could not prevail against it. Israel and Syria tried to take on Judah. They, they couldn't accomplish it. Verse 2, And it was told the house of David, that's the house of Judah, saying, Syria is confederate with Ephraim. They've teamed up, Ephraim being the larger of the ten tribes and symbolic of the house of Israel. And his heart was moved in the heart of his people, and the trees of the wood are moved with, as the trees of the wood are moved with the wind. In other words, they, they were anxious, angry, and frightened at the same time. Well, you know, when your own brother comes at you, and when he's got a foreigner with him to help him accomplish it, that's not family. That goes against everything that God teaches us. Like it or lump it, okay? Anytime that families are, uh, fight, that's civil war, okay? But when you introduce a stranger in the midst, that, uh, that makes it different. They, they were, uh, it was restless, they were anxious, they were unhappy. Verse 3, Then said the Lord unto Isaiah, Go forth now to meet Ahaz, thou and Shear, or Jazab, thy, thy son, at the end of the conduit of the upper pool in the highway of the fuller's field. You know what the fuller's field is? That's where they have fuller soap. That's where they tromp them on the, the uh, uh, sandstone until things are clean. Okay. Verse 4, And say unto him, Take heed and be quiet and fear not. Don't, don't be afraid of anything. Neither be faint-hearted for the two tails of these smoking firebrands, for the furious anger of Rethan from with Syria, and the son of Remaliah, that's to say Yah is bedecked. In other words, um, you you got to know what a firebrand is. Okay. What God is saying these two kings, you don't have to sweat. You don't have to worry about them. Their fire, their flame's already gone out, and all they are is a smoking old stick. Okay. It's just an old firebrand, just smoking in the breeze. Doesn't amount to a hill of beans. Okay. So you don't have to be afraid of them. Verse 5. Because Syria, Ephraim, that's to say uh, Syria and Israel, and the son of Remaliah have taken evil counsel against thee, saying, verse 6, Let us go up against Judah and vex it, and let us make a breach therein for us, and set a king in the midst of it, even the son of Tabiel. Tabiel means pleased, pleasing to God. But do you know who it is? It's the son of Syria and king, the son of the Syrian king. I believe that. In other words, they want to set a foreigner as king. Now, this is a type of the Antichrist being set as king in Jerusalem. 
Okay. We will approve this because the Assyrian is one of the names of the, and types of Antichrist. And this being from Syria, the very name itself, uh, uh, Tabel, is, uh, is Syriac. The name is Syriac. Uh, they, they want to set in a king of their own liking. God establishes kingdoms. Okay. Why? Because he will establish the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And God is very unhappy that they would want to go to the very place that pleases him more than any place in the world. As it's written in Ezekiel chapter 16, God loves Jerusalem. God loves Mount Zion. God loves Mount Moriah. It's his favorite place. And when people start appointing foreign kings to set upon it, watch out. Not good. Verse 7, Thus saith the Lord God, It shall not stand, neither shall it come to pass. Not going to happen. Verse 8, For the head of Syria is Damascus, and the head of Damascus is risen. And within three score and five years shall Ephraim be broken, that it be not a people. They're, they're going to be taken into captivity. The house of Israel will be taken by the Syrian. They'll go over the Caucasus Mountains, be called Caucasians then, settled Europe, and many of them later even coming to this nation. It happened. God's promises always come to pass as it is written. Have you read it? Verse 9. And the head of Ephraim is Samaria. That's Watch Mountain. Okay. Too far to go down to Jerusalem to worship. We worship here at Samaria, okay? This is the house of Israel, the ten tribes. And the head of Samaria is Rimelah's son. If ye will not believe, surely you shall not be established. This, this is kind of a, a trick saying or a cute saying in Hebrew. And, and, and what it means is, if, um, if you will not trust, you won't be trusted. Or it could even be translated, if you don't understand, you won't stand. Okay. If you're going to stand, you've got to understand the Word of God. Why? Because that's God's plan. That's the way it's going down. It is written, and it shall come to pass as it is written. So you want to trust Him, and if you trust Him, uh, you will be established. Otherwise, you're not going to be established. These two are not going to be able to establish this fake king. Why? Because it's not God's plan. Verse 10, Moreover, the Lord spake again unto Ahaz, saying, in verse 11, Ask thee a sign of the Lord thy God. <clears throat> ask it either in the depth, you, you ask it in hell, or in the height above, or it can be from heaven. Just, just ask me a sign. You're not supposed to ask God for a sign, okay? You're kind of sticking your neck out every time you do. Why? You're supposed to trust. You just got through saying it. If you trust Him, you'll be trusted. If you understand, you will make a stand, okay? So you, you don't go around and say, well, I, I almost believe that God, but, okay? Well, Ahaz is an intelligent person. He knows better than to ask God for a sign, even though God has offered one to him. Verse 12, But Ahaz said, I will not ask, neither will I tempt the Lord. He knew better. Verse 13, And he said, Hear ye now, O house of David. This is the house of Judah. Is it a small thing for you to worry men, but will you worry my God also, question? I mean, they're trying to t take over Judah and establish a fake king, a foreigner. Verse 14. Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Now, you're going to get it. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. That is being interpreted God with us. What a fantastic sign our Father gave us within this. 
So what he's saying here, they're, they're not going to establish a king. I am. That virgin is going to conceive. That virgin is going to bear a child. And you will name him Emmanuel, which is to say God with us. He will be king of kings and Lord of lords. Our father places his own king. Verse 15, butter and honey, that's to say curds and honey, shall he eat. That he may know to refuse the evil and choose the good. He's going to go by the health laws. He's going to do what's right. 16, for before the child shall know to refuse evil and choose the good, the land that thou abhorrest shall be forsaken of both her kings. They're, they're going to be gone. That's to say the king of Israel, the house of Israel, and, and the king of Syria. They're going to be out of business. Why? Because Syria, uh, the house of Israel is going into captivity by the king of Assyria. And we'll document that this is a type of Antichrist when we come to chapter 14. I'll nail it for you. You don't have to worry that that's what this is building up to. Verse 17. The Lord shall bring upon thee and upon thy people and upon thy father's house days they that have not come from the day that Ephraim departed from Judah even the king of Assyria. I'm going to bring him down like a swarm, this king of Assyria. Verse 18. And it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall hiss for the fly that is in the upper uttermost part of the rivers of Egypt and for the bee that is in the land of Assyria. In other words, God's going to let it happen. God's going to call them. Verse 19, and they shall come, not maybe, not perhaps, they shall come and shall rest all of them in the desolate valleys. That's the locust army, my friend. And in the holes of the rocks and upon all thorns and upon all bushes. Um, and that's to say the commendable trees. They're going to be on them. Okay. Now, th this would happen by the Assyrian, but also it's prophetic by the locust army. They're going to strip you is what he's saying. Every tree, everything you own, they're going to strip you. Verse 20. In the same day shall the Lord shave with a razor that is hired, that means by foreigners, namely by them beyond the river, by the king of Assyria, the head, and the hair of the feet, and it shall also consume the beard. In other words, I'm going to shave off everything you own. A little taxation here, a little bit of um, dishonest trading here, um, a little bit of inflation here. I, you're just going to lose everything. It's going to get so tough for you. And of course, the locust army brings that to pass in the ultimate fulfillment. Verse 21 and it shall come to pass in that day, not perhaps, it shall come to pass in that day, that a man shall nourish a young cow and two sheep. Now, now that's not much of a herd, okay? If you've only got one cow and two sheep, you're just barely getting by. You, first of all, being in agriculture, you got to depend on somebody else's bull, okay? to even get by here. And that can be translated in many ways. He's not doing real good. But I, I want you to catch a point. Even though he's not rich with cattle and land and has his own bull and so on and so forth, God's with him. That makes a big difference. So even though he has just one cow and two sheep and God with him, listen to it, 22, and it shall come to pass for the abundance of milk that they shall give, he shall eat butter for butter and honey shall everyone eat that is left in the land. In other words, the remnant God takes care of. It will be in abundance. You know, especially in this generation, you must learn to trust Almighty God. That's what the little little cute saying was in the Hebrew tongue back in verse 9. 
you um, you will um, if you will not trust you will not be trusted but you got to trust him he said even if it's just one little cow and two sheep you're going to do fine why because God will bless it there could be so so a whole lecture could be taught on that that God makes the difference between right and wrong between success and failure between happiness and sorrow. If he's with you, you've got nothing to sweat. You don't have to fear. Everything that comes against you is just firebrands. Fire has gone out. And God, our Father, is a consuming fire. So they're doing real good with just one cow and two sheep. 23, and it shall come to pass in that day that every place shall be where there were a thousand vines at a thousand, at a thousand uh, silverlands, it shall even be for briars and thorns. Now, a thousand vines and a thousand silverlands, that's the price of a fantastic vineyard. Okay. I mean, you could take that and you could buy the best. Not just some one little old cow and two sheep. But I mean, on the other hand, somebody that doesn't have God could have a thousand silver and buy the best vineyard in the country, and all he's going to get is a bunch of briars. Why? Because God's not with him. God's against it. It is ever, ever, ever so very important that you've got to have God with you, and you've got to be with God. Well, how do I do that? In his word. You know, uh, many people search for truth and they go to the crackpots of the world. This religion, that religion, this crackpot, that crackpot. They never go to the Word of God that documents itself and proves itself by action, by promise and promises kept from Almighty God. In other words, you can have one cow and two sheep with God's blessings and be rich or you can be rich and without God's blessings all you're going to get is a bunch of thorns verse 24 with arrows and with bows shall men come thither because all the land shall become briars and thorns um, it's uh, it's going to be turned over. They're going to take it over and they're going to strip it. They're going to tax you and overcome you to the point you won't have anything left. And do you know something? In the Hebrew, this makes it very clear that they do with this without weapons. That should tell you something, friend. Well, if they don't do it with weapons, what do they do it with? Politics. Communism has always failed. Socialism will always fail. Why? It's, it's not of our Father. It's of Satan. Verse 25, And on all hills that shall be digged with the mattock, there shall not come thither the fear of briars and thorns, but it shall be for the sending forth of oxen and for the treading of lesser cattle. It's going to be trampled. The Assyrian is coming. The locust army is coming. Well, we should just all shake in our boots. No, no. You would have missed the whole lecture of that chapter. God promised you a virgin shall conceive. A child will be born. He will be called Emmanuel. That is to say, God with us. And if God is with us, all we need is one little heifer and two sheep. And we're better off than somebody that has all the silver in the world. So what are you afraid of? Are you afraid to trust God? The truth is so very important. And you live in a generation where that virgin that brought forth that conception that took place on December the 25th, it is so very important that you know and understand there's trouble coming, but it doesn't affect you. 
if you're under that son, Emmanuel. Chapter 8, verse 1, Moreover, the Lord said unto me, Take thee a great roll, and write in it with a man's pen concerning Meher Shalas Hasbah. Now, what? that's one of the longest names in the Bible, okay? In the manuscripts, right? What does it mean? Well, first of all, God didn't write it. He said, you take a man's pen and let a man write it. I want a man to get this down good. And what does it mean? It means the word is simply four words. It means haste, spoil, speed, and pray. And, and when it's translated fully, it means they haste to the spoil and speed to the prey. They're going to take you if you're not careful, okay? But God has told you how to protect yourself. Have God with you, and you're in good shape, okay? You don't have to worry about the ones coming with the sharp razors to shave off everything you have. Verse 2, And I took unto me faithful witnesses to record Uriah the priest and Zechariah the son of uh, Jeberechiah took them right along. Verse 3, I wanted this witness here. I'm going to give you a little sign here. 3, And I went into the prophetist. Ooh, now wait a minute. W what is a prophetist? It's a woman preacher. Okay. And she conceived and bare a son. Then said the Lord to me, Call his name Meher Shalal Hazbaz. That's the haste of the spoil and speed of the prey. It's coming. Praise God. In other words, the locust army is going to ascend. And they're coming. They will have a king over them, and it won't be Emmanuel. You've read this in Revelation chapter 9. This all builds to it, and by the time we complete chapter 14, you'll have a real good understanding of it. Verse 4. For before the child shall have knowledge to cry, my father and my mother, the riches of Damascus and the spoil of Samaria shall be taken away before the king of Assyria. That um, will cover that a little further when we get to chapter 14. But this prophecy, it actually happened 20 months from the date of this prophecy. Okay. And 14 months from the date of the birth of the child. Now, a lot of people don't like to admit that there were women preachers and teachers. Why wouldn't there have been, you know? Well, well how do you know for sure that it was a female? She conceived. She bare a child. Now, if a man had done that, we would have been going contrary to God's very law. Okay. So don't try to say that there weren't women prophets. There were. Named by God, chosen by God, and used by God to do his bidding. So here we have that. In other words, you can count on God's word coming to pass. If he promises it, it's going to happen. If you trust him, you'll be trusted. If you don't trust him, you won't be trusted. If you understand him, you can make a stand and be successful, otherwise you'll fall. Okay. It's that simple. Be with God and be a winner. Be without God and be a loser. Be taken in. Verse 5. The Lord spake also unto me again, saying, you want to listen to him now. Verse 6. For as much as this people refuseth the waters of Shiloh that go softly and rejoice in Rithen and Rimelah's son, because, because they refuse the real prince, that's what Shiloh is. It means peace. They refuse Shiloh and they want to go with this far brand of Rimelah, okay, and Rithen. Um, if they want, and again, if they want to refuse the real prince, then they're in a heap of hurt. Verse 7. Now therefore, behold, 
the Lord bringeth up upon them the waters of the river, strong and many, even the king of Assyria, and all his glory, and he shall come up over all his channels and go over all his banks. Uh, you can rest assured, you know, this flood of waters reminds me as it comes to pass in Revelation chapter 12 when the flood that comes from Satan, the fake king's mouth, and really wants to destroy the children of God, but God protects them. God takes care of his own. But uh, this isn't maybe this king of Assyria is coming. He would come in the literal sense. Do you understand, this is why Jonah himself gave of his own life, tried to, so that Nineveh, which is the cap one of the capitals of Assyria, could, could not be a, a successful to accomplish this victory over the children of Israel. That's why, that's why Jonah wanted to be cast into the ocean and drown. He didn't want to save the Assyrians because he knew they were going to conquer Israel. And he felt God was using him as a prophet to go and save the very people that would destroy his own people, his own family. And ultimately he would end up being the sign of this same child that the virgin conceived and called Emmanuel because when he was cast into the sea, he was taken in by prepared uh, uh, fish and was three days and three nights in that whale's belly, and then was regurgitated in front of Ninevites who worshiped the fish god. And they thought Jonah was the Messiah. And they all converted, and they were saved. But that's why Jesus would say, that's the only sign you're going to get, three days and three nights in the belly of the earth, and he'll resurrect. So he did. So let it remind you, not maybe these things are going to come to pass. They are going to come to pass. Verse 8. And he shall pass through Judah. He shall overflow and go over. He shall reach even to the neck. That's the tender part, friend. And the stretching out of his wing shall be Shall the stretching out of his wings shall fill the breath of thy land, O Emmanuel. And he uses the name Emmanuel here. Do you know what this overshadowing reminds me of? Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. When the desolator shall come in on the wings of destruction, of, of deception rather, overshadowing, to deceive. A thing of deception in this generation be careful, my friend, and make sure you listen, O Emmanuel, God with us, that you are with God. For if you are with God, he is with you. Verse 9, associate yourselves, O you people. That's to say, you farm your little one world systems. You associate, you get your little socialism going. One worldism. United Nations, all one. O oh, you people, and you shall be broken in pieces. And give ear, all ye far country, of, uh, and give ear, all ye of far countries. Gird yourselves, and you shall be broken in pieces. Gird yourselves, and you shall be broken in pieces. Two times for emphasis. Don't mess with God. Don't mess with our Father. God protects His children. I want to know how sharp you are. I want to know if, if you really listen to the Word of God. I want to know if you trust Him whereby He can trust you. I want you to listen to this next verse very carefully. Verse 10. Take counsel together and it shall come to naught. In other words, you gang up and you form a one world system. It's not going to happen. It's coming to naught. Zippo. Zero. But what do you do? Speak the word. 
and it shall not stand, for God is with us. Did you catch it? Did you catch it? Because here, the very name of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords is fully translated rather than transliterated. What, what do you mean? Well, now, how many times did I tell you in this very lecture what Emmanuel meant in the Hebrew tongue? God with us. Nothing that is formed against us shall prosper. Why? It shall not stand, for God is with us. That is to say, Emmanuel. God states it so that you won't forget. That you will never forget. Well, tell me one more time. What does Emmanuel mean? He just did. God is with us. And if you are under that King of Kings and Lord of Lords, one of the few people that God himself forenamed before he was ever born, hundreds of years before he was ever born, named him God with us. Why? Because he was God with us. Let me quote John chapter 1, verse 1 for you. In the beginning, that means way back at the start, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. The Logos was God. And the Word became flesh and walked among us. And that word was Emmanuel, God with us. Now, is he with you or not? The decision is yours. If you trust him, then he'll trust you. You doubt him, he's going to doubt you. So you see, the ball's in your park. It's yours to, it's your move. Let him know that you love him. It's his promise of promises that he would send this one that makes life good, that makes life complete, that removes fear and protects the remnant that loved him. Don't miss the next lecture. All right, bless your heart. You listen a moment, won't you please? The Mark of the Beast on CD.